to uh, greater integration and inclusion. Uh, for instance, we have a very successful uh, example where ICT has allowed us to uh, establish a program for um, geolocation for every person of disability in Ecuador for early warning systems and evacuations in case of natural disasters, which has proven successful in a model that has been replicated elsewhere. At the same time, we wanted to use this opportunity to once again bring um, to the attention of everybody how every so more we have more uh, exciting and new developments in technology that allow us to do many, many things. And at the same time, we still keep uh, facing the fact that not every person and every person with disability can access this due to their lack of availability, affordability, and even lack of knowledge. Sometimes these uh, discussions and these developments happen in very uh, reduced circles. So we hope that events such as this and discussions within the United Nations and member states can bring light to uh, what all these accomplishments of the scientific community can do uh, and ultimately for the rights and participation of all persons with disabilities in our efforts to uh, create a development and to leave no one behind. So I thank you. Thank you so much, Irena. And uh, now let's turn to Ms. Yen Daniela Bass, Director of the Division Inclusive Social Development at UNDESA for opening remarks. Thank you, good afternoon. Well, excellencies, uh, distinguished representatives, colleagues, uh, and brave ladies and gentlemen who decided uh, to join uh, this very important event, actually. Um, I would like to congratulate, uh, first of all, our colleagues of the International uh, uh, Telecommunication um, Union for paying particular attention today while celebrating the International Day of Persons with Disabilities to the inclusion and empowerment of persons with uh, disabilities with, by, and for. The theme uh, chosen to discuss uh, uh, this uh, topic actually is the prelude uh, like a wonderful symphony to what's going to be discussed later on in, uh, in the afternoon. As I said, the whole afternoon will be about uh, inclusion and being smart. Uh, so um, inclusive cities and inclusive environments are key as well as exploring and share innovative solutions and good practices. So thank you very much for bringing this to the attention. And by the way, ITU is organizing another major event a two days event, I believe, or three days event in Europe uh, next week uh, on, on uh, the role of ICT and uh, making Europe, in this case, uh, more accessible and inclusive. So thank you very much for collaborating with DESA and the, the rest of the, of the system. I, want to sp I will spare uh, what the Division for Inclusive De Development does, uh, spare you from that, but it in it's for the department, um, it, uh, it, it is the focal point for the whole United Nations system on youth, persons with disabilities, older persons, uh, and indigenous people, as well as issues such as the family and, and the cooperatives and social enterprises. And for all of this, technology plays a major role because in all of these areas, we may find uh, persons with the disabilities or living in, uh, with the, in disabling either environments or having disabling conditions where technology and technological devices actually can make a huge improvement in the quality of life of people, of all, of all people. So to achieve this goal, we work obviously closely with governments, the UN system and the civil society as a whole. The international community has been advocating for a key role of ICT to empower persons with disabilities since the 90s. The Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, known as a CRPD, called for accessible ICTs. And CRPD has an explicit social development dimension and reaffirms that all persons with all types of disabilities must enjoy the same human rights and fundamental freedoms. ICT plays a major role in connecting people, in facilitating access to information and sharing knowledge, in participation. So technologies can facilitate social progress as a key element for empowering persons with disabilities. And it goes from education, as we said this morning, to employment, from health to well-being, from cultural to leisure activities. In all of these technologies and ICT can bring the voice 
of those people often less heard to all corners of the world. Recently, then, we had the 2030 Agenda. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is based on the principle of leaving one behind. So together with a key tool, such as the CRPD, we have to make sure that also through ICT, persons with disabilities are, are significantly included, uh, thanks to this tool, in all activities um, that relate to our life, from political activities to environmental activities to uh, education to transportation to travel, etc., etc. Having fun is very fundamental, and ICT and uh, technological devices can also support us in having that part of our life for the well-being in general. Accessibility is essential to ensure persons with disabilities and their participation, as I said, uh, in society on an equal basis. It has to be, though, accessible, usable, and affordable. And I would like to underline here the word affordable to all persons, particularly with those who have a disability that often live in conditions that are maybe not as wealthy as others because of sometimes lack of education. Now, lack of education can be overcome thanks to ICT and, technology and technologies. I'm so talking about hearing um, in, you know, aids for hearing impaired people. Or you go to a hotel and somebody rings the bell, say the waiter, in your, in your room, in the hotel. But if you're hearing impaired, you can't hear the sound. But maybe through technology, the light uh, in, in your room can, can um, start blinking, so that's a sign of how technology can facilitate and really integrate the life of everybody. Or uh, there are some, food, uh, some places, and I think of one country in Italy, for instance, where paths have been designed so that visually impaired people while walking in the park, because of the pressure of the body while walking, they have specific signals so they don't get lost and they can enjoy the beauty of, of mingling with others. It's so important. Technology can help, finally, I say, to um, um, overcome a challenging issue that most persons with disabilities have to face on a daily basis, isolation. Isolation mm. is terrifying, particularly if you have to be isolated against your will unless one wants to, to spend one year in the mountain or, or, or somewhere else to do meditation, okay? That's a free choice. But when it's not a free choice and you're imprisoned without, committed any, uh, without having any guilt and having committed no crimes, that's terrible. And uh, technology and technological devices can play a major role in promoting happiness and well-being also in terms of emotional and, and mental health. So, I could go on and on about this because I, I, I know how technology has impacted also my life. Uh, the wheelchair is a technological device, God bless it. Most of us are wearing glasses. Now we give it for granted and wearing glasses actually has become fashionable. How many people are wearing glasses even though they don't need to wear glasses? So this is, I think, the aim of technology, to make sure that whatever we use is going to mainstream um, uh, uh, persons with disabilities, et cetera, et cetera, in such a way that it becomes a diversity in the normality or a normality in the diversity, whatever you want to call it. So I'm very much pro uh, uh, technology and technological devices. There are so many good news that are coming from the world of technology, as long as we want to use it to facilitate uh, the, the, the life of seven billion people living on, on uh, Mother Earth as indigenous peoples might say. One thing, technology you see is not only for persons with disabilities. The world is demographically, with the exception of Africa, that is still growing very, there is so much youth in Africa. For the next uh, 80, 70 years, Africa will keep growing in terms of youth, but the rest of the planet is aging. Not necessarily when we age, uh, uh, we acquire disabilities, but it's easier to maybe have to face some disabling conditions. So technology there too is offering an amazing uh, tool. Let's make sure that technology is usable, is usable by older persons. 
not only by young people, often older pe persons feel a little bit um, uneasy when it comes to use of technology such as uh, smartphones, iPads, etc., etc. So it's very important there to educate. Next year, this year already, uh, up to the next uh, next year, we have still four SDGs to go. And one of these is SDG 10, overcoming inequalities, and the other one is SDG 4, education. So let's, let's see uh, and demonstrate how persons with disabilities, they themselves are leading these, uh, these SDGs, uh, okay? By empowering not only themselves, but empowering others who might not have a disability, but thanks to persons with disabilities and the technology that often persons with disabilities either inspire or they create themselves. Uh, the whole world benefit. Think of Braille, Mr. Braille. He created whatever he created for visually impaired people, but then from that, he became a keyboard a typewriter, and then from a typewriter, a keyboard, and now everybody's using computers, thanks to Mr. Braille, for persons with here visual impairments. And I could cite many, many other examples of things that were basic te technologies, and then thanks to persons with disabilities, they developed into something that now everybody can't uh, live without. So, sorry, uh, it took a little bit too long, and thanks for the moderator for not stopping me, uh, but... Um, <laughs> But uh, I, I hope that I was able to share with you some of the amazing things that technologies, technologies can do and persons with disabilities have inspired others to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danielle. It's a pleasure to collaborate with you and, and you and Dessa. We look forward to future opportunities to do it again. So in inclusion and accessibility of ICTs is also of utmost importance to us at the ITU, the UN Specialised Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. And one of the overarching cross-cutting strategic goals of the ITU is enhanced telecommunications, ICTs, accessibility for persons with disabilities and specific needs. We have extensive work in the form of guidelines, reports and capacity building to help governments to develop policies and strategies for mainstreaming digital accessibility at national, regional and international levels. So the theme of this side event is top of mind for us and I won't tell you about this, about this work but it's all at the website at itu.int forward slash accessibility. So it's now time to introduce our wonderful panel. We're so excited to have them with us. And we've included our panelists' bios in the concept notes, so we won't go through them um, in, in detail. But I did want to introduce them to you by name. We have um, Ms. K.R. Liu, an award-winning accessibility advisor. Ms. Francesca Cesar Bianchi, Vice President of Institutional Relations at G3 ICT. Mr. Hale Pulsifer, Customer Accessibility Lead at Fidelity Investments and Enable National Co-Chair. Ms. Monica Desai, Head of Global Connectivity Policy at Facebook, and Ms. Alexandra Cook, Director of Membership at ACT, the App Association. And thank you so much to all of you for joining us for this session and to help mark this really important day. So we have two questions for each of the panelists, and in the interest of time, I'm going to pose the two questions at once, and then the speakers will have 10 minutes to share their important um, messages um, and uh, innovative examples of, of ICTs empowering persons with disabilities with us. So, Kea, let's start with you. Um, the questions are, what are the barriers that we need to overcome to unlo unlock further innovation and growth in the ICT ecosystem for the empowerment of persons with disabilities? And the second one is what is the business case for developing accessible innovation ICTs that empower persons with disabilities? And I think you're going to share some examples of how organizations that you've worked with or advised have quantified the value and return on investment of such accessible, innovative ICTs. And don't worry in the audience, the speakers have the questions so they don't have to remember them. Kaya, over to you. Thank you, Ms. Winghoving, for having me. I guess it's an honor to be here. Um, there are a few barriers to entry that I've run into throughout my technology career over the last 20 years. First uh, is the, the design process. It's not about designing for someone. It's about designing with someone. In the paternalistic savior mentality of designing, building, creating something for someone, people are making assumptions about what people with disabilities need or want. Once assumptions are made, incorrect design, engineering can, will be made, leading to wasted resources and less than ideal products for individuals with disabilities. 
There's also the same ability to collaborate across disciplines and experiences, especially in the ICT ecosystem. We've seen plenty of companies start out as a group of engineers who thought that they knew exactly what they needed to build to save or fix a disability. Where were the designers in that process? Where were the clinicians and the first line medical staff who worked with patients every day? Most importantly, where were the individuals with disabilities who have firsthand experience with a particular disability? The other challenge is funding models. The standard business model for entrepreneurship is finding a strong ROI based on perceived scope and scale of an issue. <laughs> the reality is some disabilities are fewer in number and are perceived as a less urgent issue. What VCs or investors will agree to fund an initiative that will only impact a small fraction of the population? We need to better articulate the proven concept that developments of ICTs and other technologies for the disability community can in fact serve everyone. In regards to business models, if done correctly when designing for the maximum and the minimum, you end up designing for everyone. One example is when I worked at Doppler Labs, we attempted to design a product and services that can theoretically be used for the hard of hearing and audiophiles. If we can build something that works for both groups here, groups that aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, we can design for everyone. I'd also like to add that perhaps we might need to think more broadly about what ICTs entail and who benefits outside of the disability community. Email was an ICT, SMS was an ICT, TV subtitles were an ICT. Ultimately, it's in our best interest as a society to find new, more efficient, multi-model forms of communication to connect with individuals in ways in which we were previously not possible in the context of distance, language, and disability, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, KR. Some really important points, and I heard lots of uh, ums and agreement from up here on the panel, and I'm sure in the audience as well. So, Francesca, turning to you, G3 ICT has just released this week the DARE Index, Digital Accessibility Rights Evaluation Index. Congratulations. What is the DARE Index? What's its purpose and methodology? And what are the key results and learning points that are relevant to the theme of this session? Thank you, Ursula. Uh, so um, the DARE Index is actually a new tool by advocates for advocates to provide uh, advocates to benchmark and uh, track the progress made by their own countries in implementing digital accessibility policies and programs. Uh, next, please. Uh, we, we do this, uh, uh, the, the framework that we use is consistent with, in human rights uh, monitoring. So we measure country commitments, country capacity to implement, and country actual uh, outcomes and impl uh, implementation. And our experts are persons with disabilities, advocates, researchers, and community leaders uh, identified in partnership with the Disabled Peoples International and uh, we, with the, their national assemblies. And when they were not um, in, in strong enough, we, were, um, we have been using other um, uh, organizations and sometimes also organizations linked to government. But uh, we prefer honestly to uh, not to, to uh, hear the voice of government in this because we uh, prefer the, the voice of user experience, in fact. So in the past year, the global outreach has been of 121 countries, uh, which covers 89% of the world population. Next slide, please. So as a bit of background, uh, G3ICT was formed 12 years ago uh, by UNDESA at the initiative of UNDESA to um, implement the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability for what concerns digital accessibility. Uh, and we have been uh, working as a multi-stakeholder with a multi-stakeholder approach with persons with disabilities, with industry, with public sector, and with experts uh, uh, of, in accessibility. Uh, we, uh, we have been working uh, for long, uh, many years with ITU. Since 2007, we published a number of uh, technical reports in the e-accessibility policy toolkit when it's print versions as well. Um, uh, to 
uh, and also uh, the so-called model policy, and in particular the model ICT accessibility uh, policy report. So for those who are familiar with, the policy report co uh, covers uh, legal and policy foundations, uh, and so it's there where we select the variables uh, that we use into, so that we select the commitments, capacity to implement, and outcomes. Um, so those are relied on the ICT uh, accessibility model policy report. For the outcomes instead, we, um, we had the, the, the pleasure uh, about two years ago, actually, in 2016, to work with uh, two, also two sessions on accessibility here at the UN in 2016 for the 10th anniversary. And uh, uh, with I, uh, AIDA, the International Disability Alliance, and the Disabled Peoples International. And in that occasion, we uh, collectively launched uh, a um, call for action. Uh, um, and we identified 10 key areas uh, on ICT accessibility that are really uh, needed to, uh, they are essential for, uh, for us for, um, to implement policies and programs for persons with disabilities. Next, please. So the simple is very, the, the, the methodology is very simple. So we assign, there are 20 variables uh, and uh, we count uh, five points for each variable in uh, the f five commitment areas, um, five points for capacity to implement and 10 points for uh, outcomes for a total of uh, uh, 100 points for each country. So each country is measured out of 100 points. And uh, we do have a detailed country profile uh, of the DARE index uh, scores in, uh, published on our website. Um, and next, please. Um, I just want to let you know that for commitments and for capacity f to implement, uh, we go from yes, no, Question, uh, yes, no answers, so it's zero or five. While for outcomes, we have a guided evaluation scores from zero to five. For example, uh, if a country has a policy or program with minimum implementation, the country will score a two. Um, and so here you can see the guided evaluation score. Um, so in the next slide, you can see the dashboard that we have with 121 countries, and you can picture the countries uh, for cross-reference. And I give you an example, uh, if you can go next, please. Uh, we, I just returned from Jamaica just a couple of days ago, uh, days ago where the ITUs hosted the, the Accessible Americas event. So this is the Jamaica uh, country profile. So on the left side, you have actually the various uh, scores. They, they are in this score. Jamaica scored quite well, 61 out of 100. Uh, then global rankings, so also in here Jamaica uh, scores 19, it's the 19th country in the uh, global ranking. And then we do have regional ranking, uh, peer economic development group ranking and implementation ranking. On the uh, right side, we do have some country facts, key country facts, and then the commitments, <coughs> capacity to implement, and uh, outcomes. Uh, and then we do have the, the in the score summary. So if you go to the next slide, please, uh, you can see how commitments um, appears. So we do have five commitments, which are like the, what we think are the core um, legislation pieces that the country must have to um, implement uh, policies and programs in ICT accessibility, which is did the country sign and ratify the convention? Does the country have a general law protecting the rights of persons with disabilities? Does the country have a definition uh, of ICT accessibility? Does the country have a definition of reasonable accommodation? And does the country have a universal service or obligation uh, that includes persons with disabilities? And then you see the various scores. Jamaica actually scores quite well, 25 out of 10 to 25. Um, capacity to implement, those are the processes that a country must have to, in order to um, be able to um, implement the commitments. So does the country have an agency for persons with disabilities, yes or no? Does the country ha has an agency for ICT, yes or no? Process to involve DPOs in, key, in ICT accessibility policy maker, making. Uh, country refers to institutional ICT accessibility standards. And finally, ICT accessibility courses available at major universities. Uh, outcomes, those are the 10 uh, outcomes, uh, the 10 key areas that we identified two years ago, web, TV and multimedia, 
ebooks and digital contents, promoting uh, the internet among persons with disabilities, inclusive ICT for education, inclusive um, enabling ICT for employment, e-government and smart cities for all, enabling assistive technology and ICT for independent living, and procurement, public procurement of accessible public goods and services for all citizens. So some global uh, status of country commitment. Here you see that in country commitment, actually CRPD ratification is very well after 12 years, uh, most of the countries have ratified the convention. General law protecting the rights of persons with disabilities, 84% at the global level is quite good. Reasonable accommodation definition, 63%. It's so and so, but it's good to considering that at the opening of the convention, the senior in 2006, so there were only, I think, four countries with the definition of reasonable accommodation. Um, but here we have definition of accessibility includes ICT. Here we are going a bit low, 49% only, so meaning that we still have some work to do, and I think ITU need, will help um, also with member states to, to make sure that definition of accessibility includes ICT uh, because it's actually in the, in the Article 9 and the accessibility of ICT has to be considered on pair as of uh, transportation and the built environment. So it's very important that. And universal service obligation also is very important. It's, right now it's 35% only. So there is some funding there that needs to be uh, pulled out. So um, capacity to implement the next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, I just go to the, some of the areas because time is short. So some of the areas that needs improvement in terms of capacity to implement. Process to involve the persons with disability in policy making on ICT accessibility is only 23% on the, in the global results. So uh, we still have to do uh, work to do in that area. Um, standards and the uh, ICT accessibility courses at major universities also score a bit better, but um, those are more related to economic development um, uh, issues. Um, Next slide, please. Most advanced sector globally, uh, TV and web uh, leading the pack, 48% and 45%, with, followed by inclusive ICT in education, 44%. But where we are going really low is mobile and public procurement, 32% and 31%. So just to conclude, maybe uh, we can skip to top performing countries, which can be uh, just a lead of a bit of competition is uh, slide number 16. So here we have top performing currency countries in actual outcomes. So we have Oman and Qatar in United States, Oman and Qatar, um, because there are small countries that invest a lot in policies and programs, uh, United States, Brazil, Israel, Italy, United Kingdom, France, Spain, Australia. Here there is not much new, <laughs> but what is very interesting is the following slide, which is actually the their score for commitments, capacity, and outcomes. And here we have popping up a couple of countries in Africa, uh, South Africa and um, uh, Kenya. Uh, it, this is the, the their score of commitments, capacity, and outcomes, uh, and the Russian Federation as well. Uh, so to conclude, this is like uh, really an um, I would say a grassroots, crowdsourced type of uh, evaluation uh, from advocates, by advocates, for advocates. And uh, we, are, we have uh, actually an email address where you can uh, uh, send suggestion queries. And uh, we hope over time to uh, validate uh, all the, and verificate, uh, verificate any anomalies if there are, or uh, um, uh, help uncover progress uh, uh, and success stories, actually, uh, from countries under the radar. Thank you very much. Do you want to let us know what that email address is? Sure. It's index at g3ict.org, O-R-G. And it's on uh, the, our, our website in the dashboard. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks so much, Francesca, and congratulations again. This DARE index sounds very exciting. I'm sure it will help countries and stakeholders alike track concrete progress, as well as identify areas for further action. Uh, Hale, turning to you. 
Could you share some examples of the ICT initiatives that you've been implementing at Fidelity for persons with disabilities, both customers and employees? And also, how have persons with disabilities been involved in developing and implementing these initiatives? And the, what's the results been for both customers and employees alike, as well as for the company? Great. Thanks, Hal. Uh, Dan thank you so much, Ursula. Daniela, thank you. Congratulations on an amazing day. Um, I have a lot to say on this topic, and I have a bit of passion about it. Um, before I go into the answer, a, a minute and why I'm so happy to be here. Earlier, we heard uh, one of the people from Singapore, mm -hmm. Burhan Gafur, talk about how do we get companies involved to provide jobs. He mentioned two levers, cajoling them with penalties or taxes and encouraging them through incentives. Mm -hmm. There's a third lever, too, that's pulled from within the companies, which is we just want to do this because our leadership believes it's the right thing. Mm -hmm. Whatever lever you pull, there's something amazing that can happen next, which is we realize that including people with disabilities is actually supportive of our strategies. At Fidelity, we put a premium on innovation, and we all know that the most innovative ideas come from the most diverse teams yeah. that have the most inclusion. Well, disability is just another dimension of of diversity. Um, so that's the strategic alignment. You're, there, it, it, so if you are not in the private sector like we are, this isn't about you pounding on our doors to get us to contribute. We actually want to contribute and we're looking to contribute and looking for more opportunities. So that's why I'm so thrilled to be part of this conversation. Um, to your question around ICTs, like a lot of companies, we have a, an accommodations team. So if you are an associate with a disability, you call them and they help level the playing field for you with assistive tech. Um, but, but we've done some other things too. Last summer, we had an internship program featuring people who are deaf, hard of hearing. And we quickly learned something we weren't expecting. It's called deaf isolation. It's what happens when you are deaf, hard of hearing, and you are in a workplace community that wants badly to include you, but nobody speaks sign language. Nobody is fluent in American Sign Language. Everybody has good intentions, yet the person still feels isolated. So imagine you're really smart, really capable, you've earned this job, you're paid well, but nobody talks to you. That is a painful situation. To address that, we've got this example of ICT, which I'll only hold up here. These are called UbiDuo keyboards for captioning. That's U-B-I-D-U-O. What makes these keyboards special is unlike any other keyboard communication where you need somebody's email address or you need somebody's phone number or LinkedIn profile or whatever, these two keyboards are always linked to each other in real time. So as soon as I type the letter K on one keyboard, it shows up on the other person's monitor. This is excellent for people who are deaf, hard of hearing in the workplace because they keep them right by their desk and you can walk by and just type good morning, just like you'd say good morning to anybody else that you work with. Um, this helped solve our deaf isolation problem. Um, we've also had some fun in the branches with this technology here. This is called Language Line. Uh, we rolled this out in all 200 branches uh, in the last year. This technology is also excellent for our customers who are deaf, hard of hearing because in the past, if you wanted to have an interaction with somebody at Fidelity, you'd have to come and you'd write notes back and forth. Or maybe you'd have to schedule an interpreter and that could take a couple of weeks. With this, tech, with this tech, it says, no, come down here right now. This is a simple video relay interpretation service. If you come into our branch, uh, we can activate this button and an American Sign Language interpreter will appear. Yeah. And you can have a real-time three-way conversation. Uh, if I'm deaf, I sign to the interpreter, the interpreter voices to you, you voice to the interpreter, the interpreter signs to me, and we're all talking without any risk of miscommunication. Um, KR, you mentioned earlier the benefits of if you design something for people with disabilities and then you have all these other peripheral benefits. The peripheral benefit with this that we weren't expecting, um, this not only gives you access to American Sign Language interpreters, but in different parts of the U.S., different markets have different expatriate populations. In Columbus, Ohio, it's Somali. Uh, in Portland, Maine, um, it's Albanian. You turn on this device, you can get connected real time to an Albanian interpreter, to a Somali interpreter, Russian, Mandarin, whatever it is, and now we can have real time conversations in languages other than English uh, if that's the, the preference of our customers. Um, so that's some of the ICT that we've been working with. How am I doing on time, Ursula? Um, you're doing well. Okay, awesome. Um, uh, you, you also asked how are people with disabilities involved in these initiatives. Uh, I am one of my 
most fulfilling things of my career is being involved with this employee resource group called Enable. This is a club of people, it's a voluntary organization impacted by disabilities. Um, we're only three years old, but 6% of our associates are members in this firm. Uh, that's a lot, so why is it so high? Well, one reason is there's a lot more of us with disabilities than you might think. Another reason is that whether you have a disability or you are a caretaker for someone with a disability, this is really important to you. Uh, but the last reason is that disability as a minority group, it's the largest in the world and it's the one that any of us can join at any time. Whether suddenly through injury, whether slowly through age, but we can all get there. Um, whether or not you want to admit it today sitting here, at some point in your life, you or somebody you love will be impacted by disability and you'll want to be prepared. Um, so uh, now that Enable is here, we have been tapped by a lot of our business partners for our expertise, unique expertise in this space. For example, Fidelity wanted to create a new savings and investment vehicle to help cover disability-related uh, disability expenses. Uh, so this group tapped us to help come up with it, test it, name it, brand it, etc. cetera. Um, Enable also created a disability etiquette training. It's online, on demand. We used to go around place to place and teach people about it because if you've never worked with somebody who is in a wheelchair before, you might wonder, is it okay for me to touch their chair? Should I just push them or should I ask them? Um, we just demystify all of that because we all want to say and do the right things. We just may not have had that direct experience before, so this training helps. Um, assistive technologies like these uh, we, we share with our accommodations team. The latest one we're exploring is one of my favorites of late. They're called Ira glasses. So imagine a pair of glasses just like these. They have a camera mounted on the side and they come with a Bluetooth earpiece. So you put them on and you activate it and you're connected with an operator somewhere in the world who sees everything you see and can give you instruction in your ear. So imagine now you're blind. Ten years ago, if you wanted to go to an airport you've never been to before, you're dependent upon a travel buddy or the kindness of strangers. Now with this technology, I could blindfold myself and fly to Singapore and I could find baggage claim, I could find the restroom, I could find uh, ground transportation, whatever I need. This is breakthrough technology that all of our customers and business are using. So we can now choose to make it easier for them to use it or not on our, uh, uh, on our locations. Um, last thing, uh, we've also recently created a new office. It's called the Office of Customer Accessibility. This is a small team that's dedicated to strategies that will make interactions effortless for our customers with disabilities, as effortless as possible. Um, there's not one group in the firm that does this. It's a little bit of 10 or 12 different organizations that have a hand in it. Branches, digital, ac digital accessibility, et cetera. Uh, so now we're bringing all that together. Uh, we have a long way to go. Once we built this team and started looking at ourselves, we realized we have a long way to go. Um, but we do have a couple wins, like the ones we've talked about, and we're really excited about it. So I'll, I'll close with this, with this thought. Um, if you are impacted by disability, it is a deeply and personally important part of who you are. And when that part of who you are is embraced and celebrated, you are more engaged. You are more productive. You feel valued because you are recognized as a valued contributor. Um, we know at our firm that this is true of our employees because we've discovered that, but we've also found that it's especially true for our customers. So we're finding ways to make interacting with us as easy as possible for them. Okay, Ursula, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Hale. It's super exciting to hear some of these examples you're talking about. It sounds like they're really making a difference, not only for persons with disabilities, other employees, customers, but also the company as well. So it's super inspirational. Thank you so much. Um, Monica, now let's turn to you and hear about what another company is doing. What technologies and tools is Facebook using to make its applications and products more accessible? And can you describe for us the Facebook approach to developing these tools and to accessibility and how Facebook is incorporating feedback from the disability community in its development process, which we've been hearing on the panel is so important? And if, also if there's any initiatives beyond Facebook that you want to uh, tell us about concerning the tech ecosystem. 
Well, thank you very much, Ursula, for moderating this panel, and thank you to the ITU for hosting this forum. Um, prior to joining Facebook, I spent over a decade in senior positions at the Federal Communications Commission, including as chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, which develops all policies and rules in connection with accessibility, such as video relay service and captioning. Um, and so it's very, you know, this, I'm, I've been so excited having joined Facebook to be at a company that's so focused on accessibility and takes our commitment so seriously to, on these issues. Um, we've built a variety of tools to enhance access to the platform, um, recognizing that the space of disability is vast and diverse and there's no one-size-fits-all solution. Um, our commitment is inherent in our mission, which is to bring the world closer together. And when we say that, we mean everyone, regardless of, accessibility, uh, regardless of ability. So accessibility is fundamental to our mission. Um, one of the first products I want to talk to you about is automatic alt text and face recognition tools, which leverage artificial intelligence and machine learning technology to help persons who are, are blind or have low vision understand more about what is in photos on Facebook. To give you some context, every day people share over a billion photos on Facebook. Research, um, research has shown that people in the vision loss community, and this is what people have told us, we got a lot of feedback on it, that users of screen readers engage with photo content and they really wanted to have more context over what is in the photographs that they are reviewing. Um, automatic alt text uses object recognition to describe photos to people who use screen readers. And our face recognition accessibility tool, which we launched last year, can tell people using screen readers who appears in photographs in their newsfeed, even if they are not tagged, if that's allowed in the person's settings. These were both very significant developments. The, prior to this, um, the traditional mechanism for <laughs> describing photos to people with vision loss was the use of alt text. Alt text is data attached to an image that's typically used to describe the appearance and function of an image on a page. Um, traditionally, adding alt text to an image requires that the content creator supply a secondary description on a per photo basis. This is time consuming and, and an uncommon consumer activity. Facebook created um, AAT and, the, and face recognition tools to help address this challenge on the platform by automatically allowing for photo description. Today, automatic alt text can detect more than 100 concepts, such as the number of people in a photo, whether people are smiling, um, physical objects like a car, a tree, a mountain, and other objects as well. Now about 75% of photos on Facebook have at least one image identified by AAT, which is um, incredible given that there are over a billion photos a day shared. Uh, we've, I'm excited to announce that Instagram launched support for AAT just last week. Um, and we're honored that these tools have won a number of awards, including the FCC Chairman's Award for Advancement in Accessibility, as well as the American Foundation for the Blind's Helen Keller Achievement Award. Feedback from our users was extremely important in developing AAT, and we had rounds and rounds of user research to refine the experience. Um, more generally, we are consistently in conversation with the community, both in soliciting and with various um, communities and organizations um, representing people with disabilities, both in soliciting feedback from people um, about new products and accessibility tools, and in maintaining dialogue with advocates and rights groups to, make, to keep us honest, to make sure we're doing the right thing. I also want to touch on captioning at Facebook. Mm -hmm. Because Facebook is a platform, the decision of whether to add captions to videos ultimately rests with the user uploading the, the video. But we have introduced tools to make it easier for users to add captions. People uploading a video to Facebook have two options for adding captions. First, users can manually add captions, and we support captions in multiple languages. And second, for videos posted to pages and for many video ads in the US, a tool is available to automatically generate English language captions. We hope to expand that tool. And for Facebook Live, also with the increase in real-time videos and more live video being shared, 
we have invested in real-time captioning capabilities as well. Facebook live streamers can add captions either by using a closed caption inserter tool or by working with a third-party caption provider to generate and insert real-time closed captions into their Facebook Live broadcast. These are just a couple of the tools that Facebook has developed to improve access to the platform, and there's much more information available on our website. We recognize, as I said before, that the space of accessibility is, is diverse. And we have a dedicated team, it sounds like, as, as um, I'm sure Google as well as Fidelity, um, to, uh, in thinking about conditions like vision loss, hearing loss, motor disabilities, cognitive impairments, and how these might influence the ability to access technology on our platform. Um, we recognize that to build products that are accessible to everyone, we must have employees with diverse capabilities. And for us, hiring people with disabilities is a priority. We have dedicated resources supporting candidates and employees with disabilities, including an accommodation team, which supports candidate requests for accommodations at all stages of the interview process, and also employee accommodation requests in the workplace. We have a dedicated program manager that drives strategy and partnerships to attract and retain employees with disabilities. And we have, a rec uh, we have recruiters and sourcers that engage industry and university channels to identify and connect with candidates with disabilities. Um, in fact, Facebook was named as one of the 2018 best places to work for disability inclusion in our first year of participating in the American Association of Persons with Disabilities um, Disability Equality Index, mm -hmm. and we're very proud of that recognition. Um, outside of Facebook, we want to drive innovation and accessibility, and that's why Facebook is proud to be part of the Teach Access Initiative. Announced, this was announced on the 25th anniversary of the Americans with, with Disabilities Act. Teach Access brings industry, academia, and advocacy together to create models for teaching and training students of technology to create accessible experiences. This initiative includes, among others, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Yahoo, Stanford, MIT, and Georgia Tech. The challenge that we identified is that accessibility is not often taught in computer science design and user experience degree programs. So Teach Access launched an online tutorial covering best practices for accessible software design in order to advance uh, accessibility training in higher education. And we're honored that Teach Access has won a Heroes of Accessibility Award from Nobility and received an honorable mention for the Federal Communications Commission Chairman's Award for Advancement in Accessibility. Thank you, thank you so much. And um, some more really exciting, inspiring tech developments inside and outside Facebook. So thank you so much for, for inspiring us with those. Uh, now we're gonna turn to Alex. Alex, SMEs are a huge part of the economy. How are small businesses and startups using ICTs to improve accessibility for persons with disabilities? And what kinds of technology developments will drive future innovations in ICT innovations? Yes, um, so I just wanna start by saying thank you to Ursula and to the ITU for inviting us to speak on this and give a little bit of background on the App Association. Um, so the App Association, we're a global nonprofit trade association for small and medium-sized technology companies. Um, so we represent more than 5,000 app makers and connected device companies across the mobile economy who are leveraging connectivity of smart devices to create innovative solutions that are making lives better around the world. Um, our members provide the touch point to the mobile ICT revolution, which continues to create new efficiencies across sectors from finance to healthcare to manufacturing. Um, and so at the App Association, we really do believe that ICTs are gonna play and have already played a central role in improving the lives of those with disabilities. Um, and we're already seeing incredible advancements in using ICT to improve accessibility. And one thing I wanna note um, is that both at the App Association and I think with our membership, when we're talking about ICTs for accessibility, we're defining accessibility um, very, I think, broadly, um, whether that's sort of accessibility for the aging population or for cognitive disabilities, we wanna make sure that when we, when we mention accessibility, what we're really thinking about is sort of a wide variety of ways that we can make technology more accessible. Um, 
And so with that, um, tech developers and platform owners uh, have already sort of worked to recognize the respons their responsibility to develop technology that is accessible and usable by everyone. And technology developers have made great strides forward in both increasing the accessibility of their own products and services for those with disabilities, as well as providing their developer communities with the capacity to do the same. Um, so to directly answer the question, um, you know, we really believe that the role of the small business developer and entrepreneur is essential to accessibility today, and even more so moving forward. Um, you know, our industry has has really grown alongside the revolution of connected devices, um, and we sort of see connected devices as the thing that's opening the door for persons with accessibility, but the software that our members are creating, that's what's really opening the world, um, and it's providing access and opportunity and experiences that really were previously out of reach. Um, so when it comes to how our members are approaching accessibility and their development, there's sort of two distinct trends. Um, so there, there are those companies who are developing products that are specific for those with disabilities. Um, one great example that I like to talk about uh, is a company called Prolo Quo To Go, um, and they're helping give a voice to children who are nonverbal um, through the iPad. Um, but then there are also those companies who are integrating accessibility features that the platforms provide. Um, so a great example of that, um, Apple's iOS has features that include voiceover and braille support, uh, accessibility keyboards, and switch control that can be integrated across devices. And it's relatively simple for the developer to be able to turn on those functions in their applications. Um, so in that same vein, I think one of the things that we really work to do is assist our members in incorporating the needs of, of disabled end users um, sort of from the beginning. We call that accessibility by design. Um, and we provide education and tools to our members to really help them achieve that. Um, I, you know, as a director of membership, I get to talk to our members a lot. And one of the things that I love doing in these sorts of settings is really talk about some of the companies that we work with. Um, so I'm gonna, this is a little storytelling, but I'm gonna talk about a couple apps that our members are already creating um, that are already being used. These are made by small businesses um, and they're being used all over the world to improve accessibility. Um, so the first, uh, Avaz, is a augmentative and alternative communication app developed for children who are nonverbal or have difficulty speaking. Um, the apps help facilitate communication for children with autism spectrum disorders, Down syndrome, and cerebral palsy through picture and text-based communication interfaces. Um, they allow children to communicate not just in therapy sessions, but with their peers in school settings, at home with their families, and wherever their curiosity may take them. Um, P3 Mobile is an on-the-go video relay service app for deaf and hard-of-hearing people. Through the app, users are connected to interpreters in real time, making it easy to make and receive video calls anywhere they can access Wi-Fi or a cellular data connection. Um, Speech Central is a text-to-speech app that allows users to interact with websites and RSS feeds on the go. The app can be used as an assistive technology and helper for people with visual impairments or dyslexia. Um, and through the apps, users can interact with web pages, access eBooks, um, and upload their own text uh, file formats that can be then uh, read aloud. Um, and then the last one I want to mention, um, there are apps that are uh, like, I'm going to mention too, Access Now and WheelMap, and they utilize GPS and crowdsource data to create comprehensive maps and lists that detail accessibility features of buildings and establishments across the world. Um, and these apps include information on accessible washrooms, on parking, on elevators, ramps, and they highlight the best entrances that you can use to get into the buildings in the first place. Um, and these are really just scratching the surface. Um, I think to directly answer the second question, we really see artificial intelligence as um, a key and, and something we're really excited about in sort of the future improvement of ICT accessibility. Um, and while there's not necessarily a single definition, uh, or at least agreed upon definition, for artificial intelligence or machine learning, um, we know that they generally refer to the human-like capabilities of specific mathematical algorithms processed by computers, which really just means that they can learn based on behavior. Um, and so for, for us, we see really three key ways um, for AI to make improvements to accessibility. Um, the first is in human connection. Technology that utilizes AI can provide equal access to information and opportunity by facilitating communication. Um, technology can create possibilities for all people, regardless of how they listen, speak, or write. Emerging solutions include automatic sign language, real-time translation and captioning, automatic text recognition for those with visual impairments, and even comprehensive accessibility for websites and digital storefronts. Um, I think the second opportunity we see for AI is in modernizing life. AI is capable of hearing, seeing, and reasoning with increasing accuracy. 
By making software and devices smarter and keeping them affordable, people gain independence to perform daily tasks and personalized tool for their unique needs. Um, and finally, we see AI um, sort of increasing accessibility for employment. Um, according to the U.S. Office of Disability Employment Policy, the unemployment rate is twice as high for people with disabilities. Um, and we think that AI can help people develop professional skills and influence workplace culture and inclusive hiring. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that we think that it will be really important that we work together in the future to facilitate partnerships. Um, that's between small business innovators, developers, governments, larger companies, and other stakeholders. Um, and we're already seeing some of that happen. Um, I wanna mention Microsoft's AI for Accessibility program. It's a $25 million five-year effort to promote the development of AI applications for more than a billion people with disabilities worldwide. It consists of grants and investments for developers who create innovative AI apps for the disabled to run on the Microsoft Azure cloud. Um, you know, we recognize that the opportunities are great. Um, we also recognize that challenges do remain. Um, and so for those with disabilities who have access to necessary infrastructure, typically in developed regions of the world, realizing accessibility through technology is easier. Um, and in developing countries, achieving the same level of accessibility can be much more difficult and sometimes impossible. Um, but we're very committed to helping build capacity anywhere it's needed in order to improve accessibility. Uh, and the App Association strongly supports the inclusion of disability access in the ITU's 2030 agenda for sustainable development. Um, so all this to say there are challenges, but we think that the role of ICTs in improving accessibility for disabled persons will continue to grow um, and that the sky is the limit. So thank you. Thank you so much. It's super exciting to hear about also how small companies, you don't have to be a huge company to be doing really innovative things in this area. So thank you so much for sharing those with us. Now, because our speakers up here have been incredibly speedy, we actually have time and we really appreciate that. It shows how, how, how respectful the folks are up here of each other as well. Um, so if there's any uh, questions or comments, I think we could take a couple. And then just to give the, the panel up here advance warning, um, then we'll come back to you all and you can either um, answer or, or comment on, on anything we hear or make a final one sentence tweet size message for us all to take away. So something to think on while we see if there's any questions or, or comments from the, from the audience. Anybody uh, want to, perhaps um, I think, I'm not sure if it will actually appear up here, so you might need to raise your hand if you want to make a comment. Yes, sir, thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Derek Cogburn from American University, our Institute on Disability and Public Policy. And uh, I just love the panel, so thank you very much. Um, perhaps for the last person, but maybe others, uh, around AI and some of the um, uh, more advanced technologies, um, are there concerns that you have around uh, vulnerabilities for persons with disabilities in the use of uh, technologies, whether we're talking about perhaps ethical um, issues, data breaches, privacy, uh, cyber attacks. Are, there, are, is it, are you or anybody on the panel thinking about the, the danger to persons with disabilities as we continue to, you and me and others, promote the use of ICT, but are we thinking about some of the dangers as well? Certainly. I think with any new technology, you have to sort of consider those things. I think the, eth the ethical implications are particularly fascinating in this case. Um, and you know, I, I, it would be silly for us to not recognize that there are issues even just in data bias or data stewardship or owner, you know, ownership of data, privacy, security, those are all things. Um, I think that they're all still questions that we're trying to find the answers to. Um, I think that we certainly are taking sort of a pragmatic approach and we believe that there are answers to those questions. Um, I think that we see the answers coming from those partnerships, whether that's with government, whether that's with other stakeholders, you know, but I, I would say I don't think the questions are answered yet, but I think that they will find ways to talk through them and, and find sort of the key to the solutions. Yes, please, Hal. Um, Derek, thank you for your question. I have uh, a similar answer. So we talked about this video relay interpretation. There's video relay service as well where people who are deaf, that's how they make phone calls. Um, I call the VRS and they call the company for me. Um, I am clearly a middle-aged man. I live in Massachusetts. So, um, But what if the interpreter is a young woman from the South? Uh, different gender, different voice, different accent. If you, if you care about authenticating your customers and you see customer information and customer voice that are very different, 
that's scary. Uh, and so we try to go to extra lengths to confirm that the person is who they say they are. Similarly, though, the bad guys are exploiting video relay service to pretend you know, just to basically get away with not having to emulate somebody's voice. And that is certainly a vulnerability that we've seen and we're tightening up as much as we can. It's really unfortunate. D does anyone else on the panel wanted to comment on, on that? No? Is there any other question or comment from the audience before we come back to the panel for their tweet size? Key message. Uh, Daniela, yes? Thank you. Thank you. Um, we spoke, I spoke, and but also other colleagues uh, and, and panelists mentioned how uh, technologies or technological devices can facilitate the um, um, breaking of isolation. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about that because since I do have a disability myself, I really know how it feels sometimes to be isolated for various reasons. And I do know how technology or technological devices uh, uh, can break uh, isolation. So here I am talking about uh, travel. We can travel with our thoughts, we can travel with our voice, we can travel with our bodies. So travel, um, it means uh, that we can reach places and if you can reach places, you're not that isolated. So what is the role of technology in making sure, for instance, that in transportation is uh, made um, usable and accessible through the use of technology. I, I travel a lot, I fly a lot. And when, for instance, uh, instructions are given to uh, passengers on how to use your safety belt and other safety uh, security measures, uh, very little is done when it comes to, through the use of technology in this kind, uh, in, in this case, uh, communication and screens and stuff where you read or see things, uh, it's not really much accessible to all passengers at all. So this is an example, or um, if there is going to be a natural disaster, for instance, how are we going through the use of technology to make sure that uh, everybody is alerted in time because if you have uh, um, the, the television, for instance, with uh, subtitles uh, saying uh, news, you know, please, et cetera, et cetera, and you are visually impaired and maybe they're not, the news are going on, but not necessarily they're saying what you can read, that group of people might not be put in a situation where they can save their lives. It's just some examples where technologies can be very useful uh, in order to make sure that uh, in depending on whatever issues we have to face, we are um, facilitated in uh, not only living a better life, but actually saving our lives. These are some examples. I can think of what happened in Japan years ago when there was a tsunami. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, alarms were given by human beings, that is the indigenous people living there. They could read the nature. And they knew well before the disasters happened that something was going to happen. But then we also used, they also used technologies and they also trained people. And they made sure that um, um, everybody, even those people with the mental disabilities, for instance, were trained to go to their neighbors to, to, to inform their neighbors that there, were, you know, an, there was an alarm. So two cities, in spite of the tsunami, managed to save most of the population. Also thanks to the use of, um, well, human resources and human capital, but also through the use of appropriate technologies that could uh, inform information everybody. So just curious, if you have any other examples, then uh, those are provided so far that are mainly focusing on uh, computers and softwares and hardwares and other things I'm not very familiar with. I mean, you raise very important points in terms of emergency communications and travel, that's for sure. Um, uh, what I find interesting is another application um, as we move into more use of artificial intelligence and, and virtual reality. We, um, you can travel even with motor disabilities through, um, through virtual reality. Mm -hmm. We have an interesting application through our Oculus technology um, with our VR headsets where you can, for example, visit the Anne Frank house and climb up the stairs and you know, read the diaries and sit in the furniture and have an immersive experience even if you can't physically travel there by, by plane or train. And so I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities 
through, um, through technology for, for travel. Thanks. We're, we're nearly at the end of our session, so I would like to just give the, all the panellists a chance to leave us with a final brief message. Um, Francesca, can we start with you? What's your, what's your key final message that you would like everyone to take away with them in terms of the role of ICTs for the empowerment of persons with disabilities? Yeah, I, I think... Um I think probably leapfro leapfrogging on a new technology, I think, will allow countries to perform very well. Uh, we saw from uh, the, 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 uh, the index uh, there are a number of opportunities uh, to, for improvement in all the key uh, technology areas that we have identified. And so uh, also referring at uh, artificial intelligence or other technologies that are in the pipeline, uh, that I think uh, will, it is my final message and <laughs> food for thought. Fantastic. Leapfrog away. Yes. Yeah. Kea, what about you? I mean, for me, technology has been a part of my life since I was born. I was uh, a preemie and uh, an ICU and that an incubator saved my life and I wear hearing aids and that allows me to communicate every day. And I'm very hopeful for the advances in technology to allow me to maybe hear better, communicate better, or allow other people to feel comfortable to incorporate that technology in their life because it is so highly stigmatized today. And I am very hopeful with the power of AI and machine learning that even though there's privacy issues, that technology could maybe allow me to walk down the street and know there's actually somebody walking up behind me. Because today I can't tell that. So I, I think there's an incredible future where technology and AI and machine learning can do some incredible things and change people's lives. And I'm very excited about that. Fantastic. Alex? Yeah, I would echo the exact same sentiment. You know, I think that ICTs and especially SMEs in this space um, are really going to look for ways to improve accessibility um, and, and they're going to use every technology available. And I think that, again, SMEs are really looking for opportunities to work with platforms and with big companies to solve some of that. You know, everybody has a smartphone in their pocket. Not everybody, but a lot of people um, have smartphones in their pockets. In the U.S., there are more smartphones than people, so or connected devices than people. And so this is something that I think SMEs are really looking to tap into and figure out ways to solve real-world problems for, for people. Thank you, Monica. Sure, I think for those policymakers in the in this audience, I think it's um, my uh, my ask is to um, keep in mind collaboration really is key. I learned that at the Federal Communications Commission when I worked there, it was really important to both work with work closely with um, groups of people with varying disabilities, with technology companies, with manufacturers, with the regulated community. It's important to get all points of view as you're moving through the process of deciding on new policies or laws or regulations. Thank you, Hale. Yeah, thank you, Ursula. Um, I would close by saying we're appreciating that disability and assistive technology is everywhere around us. Disabilities are permanent, but they're also temporary. They're also situational. Uh, I brought a couple of assistive technology devices. Did anyone else in the crowd, show of hands, bring an assistive technology device? Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you go completely blind between now and the end of this session, you can do everything on this device that you can do right now. And if you think, oh, that's not going to be me, the next time you go to the eye doctor and get your eyes dilated, you don't have to go with that two or three hours of not having access to email and text. You can do everything on this device without being able to see. And that's just where assistive technology and accessibility is today. It's a really exciting time. Thank you, Irena. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for the rich discussion. Again, it was a pleasure and an honor to be part of this event. Uh, also very encouraging to, to listen with companies, what other actors are doing. Uh, we are a member state organization, but we always talk about partnerships. Mm -hmm. And we do hope that these partnerships continue. They need to continue. And not only in days with this, when we celebrate the community of persons with disabilities, December 3rd, or when we have our conference of states parties of the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disability, which Ecuador will be chairing next year. But uh, all through our time, all through our work, all through our governments, uh, I do hope also that this very rich discussion encourages other future initiatives, again, not to wait again until next year to take stock. 
but to continue working together. And I do hope that my country will continue to facilitate mm -hmm. those opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Irena. Daniela, you have the last word. Thank you. I'll be short. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much to ITU. I'm really very thankful to, to the support we, we are receiving from the private sector and other stakeholders, and above all, by member states who really believe in this and allow us within the you know, staff members uh, to, to, to work and have mandates, mandates to work on this and try to suggest policies and recommend policies that then member states uh, elaborate and eventually decide to, to adopt for us to work all together. An appointment. I'm going to, to speak Japanese. Who is Japanese here? Great, so my Japanese won't be evaluated because I'm not going to speak. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's a way of saying in Italian, um, that when you speak a language that might not be simple for others to understand, or maybe it is next February, from the 11th to the 21st of February. There is going to be the Commission for Social Development, which is a a commission that will be discussing also issues related to disability. And the emerging topic that we'll be discussing is about uh, inequalities and empowering people, particularly when they're facing uh, situations such as natural disasters or man-made disasters, conflicts. So the role of ICT and technical devices is key and fundamental. Let's plan and I take the suggestion of the permanent mission of Ecuador, let's plan together an event during the Commission for Social Development that then brings whatever we discuss to the Economic and Social Council and from there up to the General Assembly where 193 countries meet every year to discuss policies. Let's strategize together. This is the space the United Nations offer to everybody. We are here to support you and you are there hopefully to support our efforts. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So please everyone join me in thanking our fabulous panel and thanking yourselves for, for going your lunch to join us. And let's take up that exciting collaboration opportunity that we were just presented with. Thank you so much, Daniela. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good afternoon. You.